Welcome to China X Office Hours 20. I'm here with Bill Kirby and with Philip Gant, a graduate student who's been working with the course, and you've met him before. And Philip, you have some updates and news for us, right? Yeah. Yes, we have a couple bits of news in terms of certificates. 1,300 learners received certificates for part four, uh, which was deemed the most challenging part so far, so congratulations. Uh, but just a bit of background, we're, we're dealing with a bit of a decline uh, in the numbers of learners. Uh, we had 2,240 uh, received certificates for part one and uh, 1,300 in this mm, part. Well, so it has gone down, but um, actually the number of people who've joined the course has increased, but I guess they're not all getting certificates. People who've actually started on part one and new people, right? Absolutely. 218 learners receiving part one certificates in the second round, okay. and the certificates for all past mini courses will be issued every four months. So okay, please great. feel free to go back and visit. I think we, sh we don't have any certificates for, we have certificates for learners, but what about for forgetters? People <laughs> who need to go back and look I mean, yes. I, think, I think, you know, I forget a lot of things. I think I... I, I forget most things now yeah. at my age. So yeah, that's that's uh, with, we'll see what we can do. Okay. Uh, okay. News from edX, new, new platform features. Two exciting new features that we'd like to talk about. One is the uh, edX course review feature. Uh, now you can uh, go and leave a course review on our learners page, so please do feel free to write a review for the parts in which you've participated. Additionally, we have a new progress bar. We implemented this in part four, and, and the response from learners has been really fantastic, so we'll be keeping it in Great. parts five and okay. on. Good. We had two discussions this week, two discussion right. forums. Remember, we're dealing with the Mongols, their invasion. Discussion question one was, what, in your view, motivated the Mongols' continued expansion? Did they just want to get out of Mongolia? <laughs> no. Actually, no one suggested that as a reason. No, 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 no. Uh, but, but I went through and I tried to draw out a bunch of different responses. So one from uh, Dagma is relative lack of resources. I think that there is some, some, sure. some validity to that, so the geographical constraints. Cla uh, K. Lodge, or Clodge, I'm not sure which, um, makes, uh, adopts part of my argument, which is that the Mongols had to keep expanding in order to keep their followers. Right. And their armies. And their armies, uh, right. armies together. Right. But he also raises the question of <coughs> whether the Mongols were sort of by nature bloodthirsty and cruel. Um, I'm hesitant to, to say that that's a cultural trait. I think the Mongols seem to have had another sense, which is that the world was given to us by Tengri, by God, by the heavens. And anyone who resists us is simply wrong. And you have no right to resist us. Because if you, once the Mongols told you to submit, if you submitted, that was fine. All you had to do was supply resources and troops for their armies and things like this. But uh, you wouldn't be massacred just for the sake of massacre. So, but they didn't like resistance. Apparently not. Apparently not. Apparently not. Right. You know, the idea of them being bloodthirsty is, is, whatever else one can say about the Mongols' view of themselves, the view across Eurasia right. was not. It was a, not little, a positive. Not a positive. This is not a big PR campaign. Dosher's basic Mongol culture, but also the dreams and desires of Chinggis Khan. And, and that, you know, bringing that personality into that. This is something Roger James agrees with, too, that Temujin's personality, Chinggis Khan's personality, um, had a great deal to do with it. His desire, his, his drive. And, and this, I think, gets us to something, you know, we don't talk about a lot, but but it seems to me with Chinggis Khan, you almost have to grant some of this, which is what might be called the great man theory of history, mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. that history is driven forward by great figures. Um, what do you think of that as a historian, though? I think uh, it, there is considerable validity to it, that there is at particular moments in time, mm -hmm. decisions taken or not taken by those who are in a position to take them right. matter enormously. Mm -hmm. And so it is rather difficult to go back and think of this history without Genghis Khan. Okay. It's yeah. impossible, in yeah. fact. Min Kendo talks about the expansion as being motivated by interlocking reasons uh, to re reinforce legitimacy, to attain wealth, you know, to plunder, um, and the notion that uh, if they didn't keep expanding, uh, by keeping expanding they would improve the lot of their own people because there's more goods coming in. Mm -hmm. But if they stopped expanding, they'd open themselves to civil war. And you know, there is in this period, a major, there are civil wars among the Mongols. Yes, it's, it's, yes. Uh, they do fight each other, so yes. there's some truth to that. A conflict of culture from Max Wiesenfeld. 
people's status depended on, on their prowess in war. Right. How many wives they had, how many livestock, how many slaves, all depended on, on success in war. So that was sort of the cultural view again. Anchor One talks about uh, the uniting the tribes in a huge army and having sort of blitzkrieg campaigns. And, and I like this because you've studied German history too. Mm -hmm. Of, of the of the modern era, and could you argue that the Mongols on horseback were an early version of the Blitzkrieg? So, what a Blitzkrieg is in mm. the modern German context mm. uh, in the 1930s and 40s was the idea of winning a war quickly and cheaply. Uh -huh. So, Germany was not armed for a long-term war of attrition, which it ultimately had to fight and lose. But initially, it won a series of battles, including national battles such as mm. over Poland or France, that were designed to be short and decisive. Uh -huh. And it's part of the, you might say, the kind of terror bombing of, mm -hmm. of European cities. Mm -hmm. uh, bears some modern similarity to the, the rapid uh, mm -hmm. new technology, as it were, of, mm -hmm. uh, of Mongol horsemen terrorizing a population. Right. And the fact that Mongols, because they would go with strings of horses, they could live off their horse, mm -hmm. could go for long periods of riding, uh, sleeping in the saddle, so to speak. Right. That they were faster than anyone else, and, and they could move more quickly. But the Mongol tribes actually didn't build up an army that was so enormous. The Mongols had 90,000 Mongols on horseback. And what percentage of that was of the male Mongolians? Oh, the they're all uh, males. Virtually everybody. Oh, no, of males, course they're all right. males. No, no, but, but, but uh, so uh, basically all adults. All adults. All adult okay. men, okay. probably from, from late teens on, would have been expected to be fighters. Right. Um, the, uh, so Anchor One, again, is, is, talks about this, and, and also this sense that she just kind of sense of invincibility and destiny. And I, that certainly is part of that. Reed Davis goes along with my view that the Mongols had to expand or collapse, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, that his army, he built an army which grew and grew. I, again, I think that we're wrong to think that the Mongols are simply ex constantly expanding in terms of their army. They're expanding in terms of their territory. And they're very good at once people have submitted Sort of say, okay, now you have a role to play. Mm -hmm. you govern yourselves as long as you provide us with the resources we need. But he also raises this question, did the Mongols have a lasting impact? And we can come back to that. Let's, let's absolutely yeah. come back to that. And then uh, Kuwe, uh, three motivations. Uh, warfare is the best way to keep the tribes together. Um, without, here's an interesting one. If you don't have a reliable tax system, what other way do you have of getting wealth if you're powerful except plunder? Right? Now, once they're in China, they do have a reliable tax yes. system, but it takes a while to persuade them that a tax system is a way of getting wealth. Right. right. Plunder is easy. Plunder is easy. Yeah. Um, well, unless you get killed plundering. Yeah. So, actually, tax systems are better, I think. But um, Finally, uh, political military leadership that had to be proven to avoid the rise of rivals, and that's certainly true. To now, there's a second discussion. So the second question is really a very interesting one, because having conquered the world, or a huge portion of it, uh, the Mongols rule over what some historians have called a Pax Mongolica, that is to say a, a, a Mongolian uh, brokered peace, a peace over this long, like the, uh, the, the Roman peace, like the mm. Pax Romana, or the American, the Pax Americana, uh, some have called the second half of the 20th century, though, it, quite frankly, it doesn't seem all that peaceful to me. No, given the uh, <laughs> But nevertheless, what are the conditions, it says, and requirements of this Pax Mongolica of peace, and were they met during this time? And here, I think we get a series of really interesting mm -hmm. responses, pretty, pretty similar responses uh, from a whole range of people. B.O. Uh, Redmeyer uh, writes, the term Pax Mongolica, of course, uh, refers to the term Pax Romana, but it does not signify a peace in the sense that there's a total absence of war, which we would think of as a country at peace, but an absence of fighting between the tribes and the states that were conquered by the respective empires. Okay. In other words, it's a forced treaty and a forced peace mm -hmm. between the parties within the empire. And that's actually a very that's insightful very, very answer. Very insightful, um, yes. As such, he says, there was peace, or she says, there was peace disputed between the parties within the empire solved by the emperor, not by taking up arms. But there was no peace in the sense that the empire itself was ever without war. And that was true of the Romans, mm -hmm. as well as the Mongols, and one could say of the Americans. Yes. Uh, in a much later right. time. So, P.C. Zhang writes, very similar. Hmm. 
If we define peace as the absence of large-scale warfare between governments, then perhaps the Mongol Empire could be considered Pax Mongolica. However, it should be noted that during the establishment of the Mongol Empire, peace was very hard to come by. Central Asia was basically annihilated. It is also said that during the process of conquering Baghdad, the Mongols destroyed, destroyed the irrigation system in Persia, and the reason, region never fully recovered. Even after the empire had conquered the Eurasian landmass, it still launched overseas attacks on Java and on Japan. Of course, they weren't really technologically up to that challenge, or at yeah. least to uh, its success. To Japan, yeah. And then, interesting point, that even though Yuan dynasty rule over China is not often uh, characterized as peaceful. The frequent infighting in the court between the steppe faction and the Gujarati faction, emperors could be murdered, policies curtailed uh, and reverted. Aggie T28 from Texas? Perhaps. I don't know. I, Sometimes I, these somebody, names somebody, throw me. But that's yeah. great, great names. There's a strong argument supporting the view that the time of the Mongol Empire was one of a Pax Mongolica. If you take prosperous economies and flourishing trade as the indicators of peace, the Silk Road was established as a safe route of passage for traders, critical to creating economic links between Europe and Asia. And so you have a Eurasian economy of sorts. Another indicator of peace, uh, Aggie says, would be the rule of law. During the Mongol Empire, the rule of law was both codified as well as enforced by the, a very efficient and organized military. That gives the Mongols a lot of credit, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe a little mm -hmm. bit too much. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that the Pax Mongolica does not seem to fit with our notions of peace, because <laughs> people are getting killed left, right. right, and center, given that we are still looking at it through the lens of the violent conquests of the Mongol Empire. But if we look at post-conquest, then I believe the requirements and conditions of peace were satisfied. And Arizona Al, Arizona, this is, this is, I think, a terrifically, really quite brilliant answer. Uh, Arizona Al writes in, I think for many in the occupied territories, it was not a Pax Mongolica, but rather a Pax Mongolica, a Pax, a, a plague. A plague. Uh -huh. um, leadership only by the conquering Mongols, and even when there were co-leaders, all of the important tasks were led by the Mongols. So they're not really presiding over a piece that lets others participate. Classification as a lower class of citizen if you were not Mongol or from Central Asia. Failure to support growth of the literati and associated glittering and so on. It might have been nice and peaceful for the Mongols when they were not making war. But for everybody else, well, so I don't know he thinks not. I, I, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm going to agree, agree with everything on this. I, I think it's certainly true that the Mongols, as a conquering minority, are, are determined to keep power in their own hands. Right. And they're afraid of, of those they've conquered, right? As they should. Um, but at the same time, you know, if you look at in the Chinese case under the UN, the, the UN government does more to support education than previous governments. I mean, there's a major yes. investment in literati education. Uh, now, they're not, they don't have a large examination system. They're not actively recruiting literati into leading positions of government, but they certainly are encouraging literati to keep going to school and, mm -hmm. and, and, and education. So it's, it's how do you rhyme those things? I think it's, it's, it's a good question. HUWJ. In Mussolini's Italy, the trains ran on time, and apparently there were no trains in the Mongol Empire. No, no but, but they, they were they, able. They, but he said few dared to hinder yes. the peace. And, and he, uh, he talks about the trade, of course, and that's how Marco Polo, and, and Marco Polo in the Polo family is not the only group of European traders to get to. No, no, no. And, and, and it's not possible, presumably, yeah. that he could get out and back right. without a sense that this right. region between right. Right. Uh, Italy and right. Hangzhou right. had been become right. comparatively yeah. safe and comparatively right. And you know, it's a, uh, presumably there's a, a Christian church, a Nestorian Christian church in, in Beijing, in the, the Mongol's mm -hmm. capital mm -hmm. for a while. And there are graves of Italians, even an Italian woman uh, trader yeah. along the eastern coast that uh, in Fujian, I believe, that dates from this period. So it's, it's yeah. So here's one big yeah. question. These are terrific, terrific answers uh, to this. But if you take this very on the whole, pretty negative set of responses uh, uh, as an assessment of the idea of a Pax Mongolica, which you might think of the legacy mm. of Mongol conquest. After the Mongols recede, mm. after the Yuan falls, mm. for China, but elsewhere, what is the legacy? 
Mm. Did anything remain? That's Did they go home and vanish without a trace? Certainly mm. the long-term enmity of them yeah. remains. When we talk yeah. later on about uh, Ming and Qing China uh, will meet the Great Wall that we know today, which was built to keep the Mongols from coming back. Right. Uh, so great yeah. was the fear of a Mongol return right. Right. in the early Ming. And, and rightly so. I mean, yeah, sure, of uh, course. So, yeah. um, you know, one of the things that one of the, one of the, the learners, Rosen Knight, says is that the Pax Mongolica was a byproduct rather than a goal. And so one could ask the question, do the Mongols have goals other than conquest? And, you know, uh, did they see themselves as bringing civilization to new peoples? Did mm -hmm. they see themselves as having some larger mission to benefit all those who were conquered? It's not at all clear that they did, right? right. And that in China, when they are, they're driven out, they say, well, you know, get on our horses and go, go to the north. Go back to being Mongols. We're, we're done here. Um, they continue to be a power in the steppe. Yes. Uh, they, you have Tamerlane, uh, Tamer yes. the Lame, right, who's there in Central Asia, who is all, continues to be a threat uh, during the Ming period. What do, they, what do they offer? What do they bring? Well, it's, I think, the first time that there's really extensive communication between the eastern and western parts of the Eurasian landmass. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't continue. Right? So when the Jesuits in the 16th century go to China, They've read Marco Polo's book about a country called Cathay. And it's a while before they figure out that these two countries, the one they're in, which is Ming, the great country right. of Ming, and Cathay, which is a word that comes from Kitai, which is the Mongols' word for the Kitans in, in the north mm. from the Liao dynasty, that it's a while before they figure out that Cathay is, in fact, China or Ming. Right. Um, and so that... Uh, I'm going to leave it. I think we should ask our. I, I, I our, think we should we our, should ask our our, 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 our learners in Mongolia and in uh, in China and anywhere in the world. Um, do you think the Mongols had a lasting impact on civilization in East Asia? It's a good question, and I think with that, um, we should say our office hours. Office hours twenty are at an end. Philip, thanks a lot for Thank being you, here. Thank you, Philip. And uh, well, we'll see you next time. Bye bye. Bye.